Well, greetings everyone again. Um, now that the whole uh, Zoom is um, Zoom group is actually much more populated, uh, so nice to see some uh, um, some familiar faces that I've actually been able to uh, visit when I've been there. Uh, I have told Pastor Al and also to Chris that every time I'm in Oxford, um, Wheatley Community Church is actually my church as well. So it's a pleasure. The background picture is actually a picture of, um, of Tirana, the, the center of the city. Uh, as a matter of fact, a year ago when we were under lockdown, uh, I put it on only to sympathize with you in UK because in Albania, we haven't had a lockdown since uh, last March and April. And then since then, uh, all our uh, churches have actually been meeting uh, face to face. There is some people that are attending through um, through uh, online, but most of the people are still gathering. So um, um, one way or another, uh, it's always good to gather together, um, especially to gather together in spirit and in unity uh, so that the Lord's presence is invited. And where the Lord's presence is there, um, he actually puts his order of service. So that's, that's good. Um, going now to the, to the scripture that we read, uh, I'm reminded of a story. Uh, well, first of all, I'm reminded of the story of the Bible in Acts when uh, uh, Peter and John, they were walking right outside of the temple and they see a crippled man. And um, uh, the crippled man is begging to them, but uh, their famous answer is uh, silver and gold. I have not, but what I have, uh, I will give. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, uh, stand up and walk. So uh, fast forward uh, 1,200 years later, um, Thomas Aquinas, uh, he was a philosopher, a Christian philosopher and teacher and uh, theologian and uh, apologet, uh, you name it, everything. So he was visiting the Vatican and uh, he was visiting what in the Catholic Church is uh, considered the representative of Peter. So that same Peter that you know, told the crippled man in the name of uh, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, uh, stand up and walk. Uh, there is the Pope and he's giving a tour. They say the story. He's giving a tour of the, of the Vatican and uh, he's showing, you know, the Basilica, I guess. And he's showing uh, how the podium is uh, golden plated. And uh, he's showing how the, there is a lot of uh, silver filigree on the carpets and uh, everything. And he's showing uh, all the good riches that the, that the church has been collecting throughout the years through the offerings uh, of the people. So, and then he scratches his head and he just smiles and he says to Thomas Aquinas, he says, uh, I guess we cannot say anymore, uh, silver or gold, I have not. And uh, Thomas replies to him and says, well, uh, we as the church should be careful that uh, neither can we say now, uh, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, stand up and walk. So um, the story that we read today, uh, I looked into different uh, versions of the scripture. Uh, I have that habit, you know, to look at the different versions and to see uh, how they translated the text. One thing that it's in particular that strikes me is that uh, this passage is actually titled, you know, the titles were not there in the Bible, but, um, but they were put later by, by people so that you can read through easier. And uh, one of the things that strikes me is that it says uh, the story of Jesus um, delivering an epileptic uh, young man. So when I look at the story, though, uh, one thing that I would like for the church to see is to see it from a different perspective. I would like to suggest to the church that even though Jesus did heal, did deliver, and this is a story of deliverance, uh, this is not quite just a story of deliverance, a story of what Jesus did, but it's actually a story of what the disciples could not do. So not a story of what Jesus did, but a story of what the disciples could not do. Uh, if we look at the scriptures as we read it before, we see that Jesus was very, it was very upsetting to Jesus. He said, how long shall I be with you, unbelieving generation? He was not actually speaking only to the disciples, 
he was not only speaking to the father, he was speaking also to the scribes or to the people of the law. He was speaking to the whole generation. How long have I been with you? This is something that you are supposed to do. You are the ones that are being with you. Me being with you gives you the power, the authority uh, to deliver the people. Um, if we look chronologically, we actually see that this story happens after the disciples had already been sent two by two and they had already delivered people uh, that were, you know, struggling from uh, uh, demonic possession. So again, this is not a story of what Jesus did, but this is a story of what the disciples were supposed to do and could not do. Uh, this is also a story of uh, spiritual warfare. And when I think of uh, spiritual warfare from my studies, from what the scripture says, and from even personal experience, uh, and even teaching at the school, uh, I, I see that there is four ways that the devil tries to overcome us, or the demon tries to overcome us from, uh, spiritual, in the spiritual warfare. And I think in this uh, story that we read here, at the very first passages of scripture, if you could, with me, we can actually identify uh, four characters in the story. There is more, but four characters that were actually not able to overcome uh, the demonic power and uh, could not overcome in the spiritual warfare. And these people are uh, I would say, are the scribes. Uh, the scripture that uh, uh, our young brother read actually had it, the people of the law, but um, the, the original scripture actually says the scribes. And the scribes are those people that were actually good people of the law as well. They, they were the people that were hired uh, by the religious groups in Israel to copy the Bible, to copy the scripture from, we didn't have the, the Gutenberg um, uh, printing press back then, you know, so uh, the people, they actually, every time they needed to renew the scriptures, they would copy from the original or from one copy to another copy. But as they uh, copied them, they were the best to memorize the scripture. And they were also some of the best to interpret. So they were like the scholars of the day. They were the people that, uh, the theologians that could interpret scripture, uh, the scribes. So the first group, it's the, the scribes. The second group that we see here is the disciples. Uh, and it seems like there was a crowd, there was a quarrel. So when Jesus is actually coming to, to meet them, it says that there was already a quarrel. And the quarrel is between three groups. It's between the scribes. It's between the disciples. So this is the second group. And the third group or the third character is actually the father, the father that is under the great burden. You know, he has a son that is sick and uh, he has the disciples that are trying to deliver the young man. And he has the scribes that are somehow counter reacting. That's why there must be a quarrel. And the quarrel is about can the child be delivered or not? Uh, at least that's what we can uh, speculate or meditate upon. And of course, the fourth person is the child or the, the young man himself that is struggling with the demonic possession. Um, these four people actually represent four ways, in my opinion, four ways how the demon, how um, the devil is trying to uh, combat or to uh, wage the spiritual warfare against the people of this world. The first one I would say is a mental uh, warfare. So, and uh, the mental warfare here, in, according to my opinion, is described by the scribes. The scribes know that the scripture is there. All the evidence of the scripture is there. Whether, uh, first of all, is there a spiritual warfare or not? Even today, I think a lot of... Uh, churches, a lot of people read the scriptures, but they are still divided whether um, there is a spiritual warfare or that was just the, um, the explanation of the day for different types of sicknesses. Now, don't take me wrong. I do believe that there is mental sicknesses, mental diseases, and sometimes they can be uh, fixed 
uh, through just simple, you know, medicine and medication and uh, support groups. But there is also spiritual warfare. And um, we know that because of the cause of sin, uh, death came into being and death is represented by all kinds of different uh, difficulties that we have, be it, be it sickness, being mental sickness, being, uh, uh, being a paralyzed person or anything like that. All of these are, are a result of sin and the sinful nature of men. And when Jesus came to this world, uh, he actually came so that we can overcome, that we can overdo all the different challenges that sin brought into this world are actually broken. The curse of sin is actually broken by the uh, sacrifice of Christ. Now, on the other hand, uh, this power and this authority is been passed on onto all the believers. Jesus actually said that all power and authority has been given to me. And then just a little bit later after that, he's saying all this I give to you. And then he's sending them out all the way to the outer skirts of the earth uh, to do what? Exactly this. And he even talks to them about the signs that will follow the believers. He also says that he would be with them all the time. Jesus also did say to the disciples that he's building his church. And he says that the gates of hell will not subdue it that, or will not prevail against it, which gives you the impression that the church is actually a moving organism that actually goes all the way to the gates of hell and the gates of hell will not actually stand. So the church will even penetrate the people, um, the disciples of Jesus will actually penetrate even the gates of hell and will snatch out of hell all the people that are being oppressed or possessed. So again, the first way that the devil tries to fight against uh, the people of this age, uh, against the disciples and against the church is a mental warfare. Uh, it can be fear. Uh, I do remember when I was only 19 years old and I was a very, very young uh, unread pastor. And I remember that we were praying in uh, this uh, first church that I planted. Uh, we were praying for, for believers. Now, remember, I was eight, 18, 19 years old. Everybody that came to church was younger than me. And I do remember there was this uh, young girl that we were praying for. And um, everything looked fine with her until we started to pray for her. And I remember that when I laid hands on her, you know, uh, demonic uh, powers actually uh, started to manifest. And it was very, very, I tell you, it was very, very scary. I remember that there was an older believer with us. And uh, as a matter of fact, it was a she, she was a, she was a missionary. And she said to me, what are you waiting for? Cast out the demon. And I was so scared because uh, I could see a powerful manifestation there. And uh, for me, uh, that came from, um, how to say, from an um, intellectual background with my parents and everything, you know, that was something that is only an illustration of uh, what is today a medical condition. Uh, the girl was manifesting uh, epileptic, as a matter of fact, epileptic uh, seizures. Um, it was a very difficult time. I gave up. I didn't want to fight. So for me, the, the spiritual warfare was a warfare of the mind, and I was scared. Another way that uh, the devil tries to fight mentally against us is through indifferentism. Uh, if, or if they can convince, if the demons can convince us that there is actually no war at all, there is no spiritual warfare, you know, uh, ignorance is another way that they fight against us. So I actually wonder whether the scribes, I mean, the story doesn't tell us here, but I wonder whether the scribes and the disciples and the father were quarreling amongst themselves about the state. You know, is this just a medical condition? Is this a spiritual warfare? Is a deliverance for now today or not? That's a way that the devil tries to win against us. And if he's won this first battle, he doesn't have to fight the other battles against us. The second character that we mentioned uh, is the disciples. And uh, the second way that the devil fights against us, of course, it's a spiritual 
warfare. Uh, in the case of disciples, it's not that the disciples didn't believe that there is a warfare. The very fact that in the end of the scripture, of the passage, it says that uh, disciples asked Jesus and said, you know, uh, teacher, tell us why we couldn't uh, spell out, we couldn't um, cast out this demon, uh, tells you that the disciples did believe that there is a spiritual warfare. They even tried to win, to overcome the demon, but they could not. Uh, and this is, this tells us that just the fact that there is a spiritual warfare and we're fighting spiritually, it actually means that we can win. In order for the disciples to win, that means the disciples need to be stronger than the, than the demon that they're fighting against. And uh, later on, we're going to talk about the spiritual disciplines that actually make you stronger when you're fighting a, you know, in a spiritual warfare. The third way that the devil uh, fights, wages spiritual warfare against us is uh, by striking us emotionally. Uh, we actually see at the father that is here, he is, he doesn't really care about the doctrinal aspect of whether deliverance is for us today or not, or was it only for that age, whether there is a spiritual warfare or not. He has a son that is under a difficult condition, and he has struggled all the life with this, uh, with this child. The Bible says that when Jesus asked him, you know, how long has it been like this? He said, since childhood. And this is a terrible, terrible state to be in, uh, to be emotionally drained uh, because of the situation. Jesus does say to him, you know, with faith, all things are possible. And you can see how emotional the father is because it says here that the father, at least the Albanian scripture says, the father is crying, is like tearful crying and saying, I do believe, but it's an emotional kind of warfare for him. You know, I do believe, but help me in my unbelief. So that's the third way. Uh, the devil tries to fight against our mind, against our spirit, and also against our emotions and against our soul. And there is the fourth character is the boy himself. The boy is the one that is struggling physically. He could probably be fighting uh, this demon that is within him, uh, you know, mentally, spiritually, emotionally, and physically as well. And uh, I actually wonder when I see these four characteristics of uh, the devil fighting against the people of God or the people in general, all the people of the world. He actually fights all the people of this world. He fights in all of these four realms because uh, if he can, he can strike against what is the great commandment of God. To Jesus says, you know, what is the great commandment? The great commandment that contains all the commandments together is, you know, love God with all your, and then it goes into all of these four areas. You know, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your spirit, and with all your strength. If the devil debilitates all of these four aspects of human life, then he can win the war against us. So the identification of how the devil is trying to fight against us, to debilitate us mentally, to debilitate us spiritually, to even uh, debilitate us emotionally and uh, what does he do? If he does this, he doesn't have to possess us. Uh, he doesn't have to, if he wins in our mind, you know, that he doesn't exist at all, that uh, the forces of sin, that the forces of the, you know, the sinful nature, the results of it are not there, do not exist. He doesn't have to wage a war at all against us. He can keep us ignorant. Uh, so that's the, that's the challenges. But if he can win, into all of these four realms, then uh, we cannot fulfill the great commandment. I do remember when um, a man of the law, another a case in the Bible, when the man of the law goes to Jesus and he says, what must I do to inherit everlasting life? This is mentioned in Luke. And uh, uh, Jesus says, what does the law say? And he mentions this great commandment. And then he says also, loving your neighbor as well. 
So uh, the fulfillment of these four and of caring for your neighbor, caring for the son of this uh, emotionally hurt father uh, are the fulfillment of the law. And the devil wants to fight us in all of these areas. Now, when we look at Jesus, uh, Jesus then says this thing five times. It's very interesting. When you want to interpret scripture in the, in the Bible, one of the things that I've learned about interpreting scripture is that uh, what is repeated the most, that is the key theme in the scripture. And uh, if we read it again, it actually says, you know, like you unbelieving. So first of all, it speaks about an unbelieving generation. Uh, the second thing is he's talking to the father and he says, do you have faith? Because if you have faith, you can do all things through faith. And then later on, the father says, I do have faith, but help me in my unbelief. So five times. It is speaking about faith. Now, what is faith? Uh, the Bible, the scripture says that, uh, that, you know, for example, Paul is not ashamed of the gospel because faith in the gospel, faith in Jesus Christ is the power of God for salvation. The Bible speaks that the righteous shall live by faith. Uh, Jesus here in the scripture says that all things, not only deliverance from, uh, deliverance from the demon, but all things we can do through faith. Faith is the key element that brings us salvation and also uh, helps us to live our daily life as a Christian. Faith actually helps us overcome in all of these areas. You know, like if you have faith, you can overcome mentally. If you have faith, you can overcome spiritually. You are actually born again. The Bible says that he came, Jesus came to this world and uh, um, all the people that accepted him, that believed in him, God gave them the power to be children of God. So it is through faith that you become children of God. And when you look at the letter of John, the letters of John, it says how John speaks to the children or to the young man. And he says, you know, you are his children and his children do not sin. The children of God, they have overcome. So uh, all this overcoming is because of faith. Everything is possible. Faith is the one that gives us determination. Faith actually decides for every one of us when we wake up in the morning. Uh, faith already tells us we can win. Uh, faith actually is what gives us courage and what gives us boldness to go there and to live according to the word of God and to even proclaim the word of God in in the face of difficulties. Uh, just yesterday, I was praying for a person that was sick. And uh, one of the things that I declared in faith is that by his stripes, we are actually healed. Now that is a war that happens mentally. It does happen spiritually. There is a, a spiritual aspect of bondage of sickness that we have in our lives. Uh, there is an emotional one as well, but it's faith that actually uh, is a starting point. Now, for the disciples themselves, the very fact that the disciples tried to cast out the demon. Now, they could not. The Bible does say that they could not. The Bible does say that the father was upset because your disciples, he tells your disciples to Jesus, they could not deliver him. So the fact that they didn't deliver was not a matter of faith. They did have faith, but their faith could not. That is the challenge. Their faith could not. Why? Because their faith was not strong enough. Now, uh, first of all, we need to understand this. It's because of faith that we can actually go into a warfare. Without faith, we cannot even go in a warfare. Because uh, we would be fearful just like I was fearful when I was 19 years old trying to cast, cast out a, a demon from this little girl. So uh, faith is the one that uh, gives us perseverance. Faith is the one that says, okay, we didn't win this time, but we can try again and we can try again and we can try again. You know, it's the substance of things that we hope for, but that are not there yet, you know, that we wait for them. Uh, faith is also uh, a state in which we stay even if we do not see results for all our lives. All the heroes of the faith that are mentioned in, uh, 
uh, Hebrews chapter 11 are uh, people that did not see the fulfillment of all the promises of God, you know, but sometimes you can have faith, even if those things that you expect, the expectation that you have is not fulfilled in your age, is not fulfilled within 25 years of uh, having faith in God, but it sustains you, even if it doesn't help you win, it helps you sustain your stand against the gates of, he of hell. That's what faith does. Faith helps you live in spite of the fact that you have not won, at least because of faith, you have not lost. And that is a very important matter for us as Christians. It's not about just winning, but it's also about not losing, keeping the stand. And that is what faith does. Now for the disciples, they had faith and because of faith, they tried. Now they didn't win, but they were not losers either because Jesus does promise us that you know, you will go to the ends of the earth, but below, be, behold, I am with you all the time. So physically, he was with the disciples, but now in spirit, he's amongst each one of us in spirit so that we can win this spiritual warfare. Another thing that is valid to mention here is Ephesians talks about our war is not against flesh and blood, but against all the spiritual powers and dominions. And, uh, you know, there is uh, four different characteristics there of the spiritual warfare, which means in every area of our life, in every area that we're struggling, whether be it financial, be it COVID, be it uh, pandemic, all kinds of things. There is, a, there is a physical warfare, and we told you about, there is a physical warfare in this story, but there is also a mental warfare, but there is also a spiritual warfare, but there is also an emotional warfare. And we have to fight into all of this because these are areas, these are territories that God wants to get hold of us. There is not only a spiritual possession, but there is also a mental possession that we can see in the people of this, of this earth. So anyway, without faith, we do not even have the boldness to start a fight. Now, um, as we go to, uh, towards the end of this message, uh, I want to go to the solution. What is the solution of the story? You know, now we said in the beginning, this is not the story of what Jesus did, but it's a story about what the disciples could not do. We did say that five times the word faith is mentioned here, but another word that is repeated here is the word can or cannot. It started with, the story started with the state of the disciples, of the scribes, of the father and of the boy that they could not, that they were losing in all of these four areas. But it's also a story that ended with answering, you know, why they could not. So the disciples asked Jesus and they said, uh, why couldn't we expel this demon? Why couldn't we cast out this demon? And Jesus says, this kind uh, cannot be cast out except by prayer and fasting. Now, let's talk a little bit about, you know, sometimes we hear um, people say that we have to identify the type of demon so that we can identify how much we need to pray and fast about this. You know, like only because the word kind there, the, the word kind talks about a particular kind that it's like stronger than the others. And um, they put a lot of mystery in this spiritual warfare, which is actually, it's, it's not supposed to be a mysterious kind of warfare, but they try to put a lot of mystery to it, you know, like a woo thing that actually causes even us to, to lose the very first battle, which is the battle of the mind, you know. Um, Jesus said in the middle of the scripture of the passage here said, with faith, everything is possible. Now, we also said, we also established that Jesus did fight a spiritual warfare and they believed, but they could not. Which only means that their faith was not strong enough. So the whole question, if we can do everything through faith, we can live through faith. That means the only way we can actually face 
anything in this world is faith, but a faith that it's strengthened. So I would actually like to um, illustrate this last part, you know, of faith. Faith is something that you exercise. Faith is actually an action. Uh, faith is a muscle. So just like uh, when we talk about muscles, and I, I actually, guys, I happen to go to the gym a lot. And uh, the, the trainers at the gym uh, tell me, you know, the, the way you can lift more weights, the way you can build more muscle is because of exercise and supplementation or exercise and dieting. Now, when we talk about faith as a muscle, as the spiritual muscle of our spiritual life, uh, we also need to talk about exercise and supplementation or dieting. As a matter of fact, here Jesus says prayer, which is exercise, it's a discipline. It's a repetition. Uh, you don't do only once and you say you don't need to do it again. How many of you have said the sinner's prayer? You know, you've said it many times. But every time you go back to a place of uh, spiritual darkness, a place of spiritual difficulty, you then say, you know, I better say that sinner's prayer one more time, even more heartfelt this time, you know, no matter whether you are a young believer or an older believer, you know, it could be spiritual, it could be doctrinally incorrect to do it, but you do it anyway, just in case to be safe. And that is what about, uh, about prayer. Prayer is about repeating uh, praying about things that you've already prayed before. It's just like that exercise. You know, when I go to the gym and I'm lifting some weights, I do the very same exercise I did the other day and the other day and the other day, four years, five years ago. As a matter of fact, knowing how to do the exercise is not enough. You have to actually get there and do it. So even for, for myself, years later, uh, if you stop, your faith gets weaker. So this is my explanation for the fact that the disciples had already cast out demons because they said in a story a little bit before, days before or weeks or months before, they said even the demons, even the demons respond when we cast them out uh, under your name. Now, the same disciples, probably they had gone into a, into a, a spiritual weakness. Maybe their prayer life was not strong enough. Maybe they did not uh, do the things that they were supposed to do, the prayer and the fasting. As a matter of fact, uh, they were even accused from uh, scribes before Pharisees. Why don't your disciples fast like the others fast, you know? And Jesus now is telling them that you should actually pray and fast. Prayer in itself, it's what helps us in the intimacy with God. Uh, how does the intimacy work? How does prayer work? In the prayer, we speak to God, he listens to us. He speaks to us, and we listen to him. And many of us, you know, sometimes we pray to God and we then stay in silence. And it seems like God is not talking to us. You know, like we, we I tell you, you know, God does talk to the people. But sometimes it is through scripture. Sometimes when God talks to people, he actually... Um, he, he actually will guide you to different areas of scripture. Uh, it is very interesting that this morning, and this is, I, could, I, have, I have a witness even that is listening to this sermon now. This morning, I knew already uh, weeks in advance what I was going to preach and share. And this morning, I received a text from a brother that is all the way from Singapore. And he sends me a devotion. And it is about spiritual warfare. It's not about all that I'm training but it's also about the community of believers that is helping, that is the Holy Spirit is orchestrating for me, for you, for everyone, that we do not miss the principles of the scriptures that we are reading today. Uh, that, that's what it is about. So uh, prayer, again, is a repetitive. It's something that we do every day, that the prayer of yesterday, the manna of yesterday, if we use it today, it's going to go bad. Today, we need to repeat it again. Today, we need to be fed again by the scripture. You know, one thing that the Bible, uh, the only scripture, as a matter of fact, that I find in the Bible that talks about uh, prayer about faith is this very verse, this very scripture where the father says, um, uh, I have faith, I believe, 
but help me in my disbelief. You know, he's asking Jesus. Nowhere else in scripture you can find about, uh, you know, about praying to have more faith. But it speaks that faith comes by hearing and listening to the word of God. Now, prayer is what does that. You know, in prayer, in intimacy, you pray to God, you read the scripture, your faith is going to build up. Now, here it says prayer, but it also says fasting. Uh, one small principle about fasting is that fasting is not a hunger strike. You know, so what is fasting? Fasting is not just not eating. You know, not eating alone is not going to help you spiritually. It's not going to grow you in your faith. Uh, not, e not eating alone is only going to help you in your, you know, keeping, you know, your, your, your fat down. That's all. But the truth about, the truth about fasting is actually uh, sacrificing things that are important in our life that they take our time. And actually, what's more important, take the time of our prayer and of our reading the scripture and of intimacy of, with God. So the whole story is actually not a very difficult story. It's a very simple story of having intimacy with God, repeating, reading scripture, repeating, reading from scripture, you know, praying to God, getting to know the, the heart of God. And then we will see, you know, like surprisingly, we will see that at the right time, at the right moment, there will be interferences, either from scripture, either from friends that are all the way from the other side of the world, giving you a scripture or an encouragement in the time of need that you have. And that is about, but uh, that thing is actually going to be missed if we actually are not fasting. What, is, um, what, is those, what are those things that are hindering in our lives to have intimacy with the Lord that are uh, debilitating our faith, that are actually making our faith going weaker and weaker every day? Um, so uh, in conclusion to this sermon, uh, I would like to encourage every one of us, maybe in a time of prayer, uh, to meditate. We are not going to go into a, into a big hunt, but like a, a very, very small, you can identify right away what are the main things in your life. You know, for some might be food, but many others, it could be media, uh, the amount of time we spend maybe on Facebook on online activities, um, you know, being in lockdown, I do realize that a lot of people have been um, debilitated by so many things in our lives uh, because uh, a big bulk of our time has been taken away by, uh, by different activities that are not sinful, but are replacing what we are supposed to have in the intimacy with God. So, Maybe a time of meditation now uh, to think what are those things and then let us fast on those things. Uh, I want to encourage us. There is a scripture in, uh, um, in, the old, in the Old Testament in Isaiah 58. There. Verse 6 till verse 9, it says, is this not the fast that I have chosen? So let's pay attention to the fast and what, are, what is the result of the fasting. And Jesus says, uh, sorry, God, but Jesus says, is this not the fast that I have chosen? Uh, Isaiah 58, verse 6 till 9. Is this not the fast that I've chosen? To lose the bonds of the wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free. And that you break every yoke. Is it not to share your bread with the hungry? And that you bring to your house the poor who are cast out. When you see the naked, that you cover him. And not hide yourself from your own flesh. Then your light shall break forth like the morning. Your healing shall spring forth speedily. And your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard, then you shall call and the Lord will answer. You shall cry and he will say, here I am. Even the battles that we fight and we cannot win on our own, please remember the Holy Spirit 
and Jesus and the Father, they say that they are always with us. They even say that we are in their hands and nobody shall pluck us out of their hands. So let us have courage. Let us have boldness. Let us build our faith. Uh, and let us meditate now what we have to fast so that we can be, bring deliverance. First of all, deliverance to ourselves, mental deliverance, spiritual deliverance, uh, physical, emotional deliverance, but also deliverance for our neighbor, for our church members, for everyone that surrounds us. Let us meditate and pray.